It's a very great pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Ellen Williams. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Dr. Williams was born in Wisconsin, but when she was still young, her family moved to Michigan. She earned a bachelor's degree from Michigan State in chemistry, 1976, and went on to earn a PhD from Caltech, also in chemistry, 1981. That is where she and I met, because we both worked in the same research group. We were graduate students together. After her PhD, she went on to join the physics department at the University of Maryland, where she was named Distinguished University Professor in 2000. Dr. Williams is a member of two very prestigious national academies, the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Science. There have been three main themes in Dr. Williams' career. The first has been science, and she is well known as a brilliant scientist. Her fields of specialty have been statistical mechanics of surfaces, electronic materials, and nanoscience. She is a master of both experiment and theory. Her, experiment, her scientific work has been recognized by three major national awards, one from the Materials Research Society and two from the American Physical Society. She also founded the University of Maryland's MERSEC, which stands for Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, and served as its director for 15 years. The second theme in Dr. Williams' career has been national defense and security. For many years, she has been a member of JSON, a select group of independent academics that provides technical analysis on issues of concern to the United States government. She is an expert on the nuclear arsenal. She currently chairs the National Academy's Committee on Technical Issues for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. That committee will soon release a major report. In the past, she served on the Congressional Committee to review the strategic posture of the United States, which was chaired by James Schlesinger. The third theme is a new one, energy. Two years ago, Dr. Williams took a leave of absence from her position at the University of Maryland to become chief scientist at BP. Those of us who knew her as a scientific colleague were very sad. We were very sad to lose her in that capacity, but at the same time, we were happy because there is simply no one smarter or better to work on the extremely important issues of energy and environment. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for that lovely introduction. I'm overwhelmed. And thank you all for coming tonight. I've been visiting uh, Iowa State today, and I've been having a wonderful day uh, visiting some of your research activities, in particular those involving biofuels, which has been uh, just eye-opening and, and quite impressive. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about science in the energy industry, some of the things that I've learned since joining BP. And so let me start right out. I'd like to start with a little bit of a uh, by topic. Uh, as most of you are aware, we're coming up to a two years anniversary of a very sad and unfortunate event, which was the accident in the Gulf of Mexico in which an oil rig blew up, killing more than 10 people and causing a major oil spill. I had been at BP for three months when that happened, and I was appalled, as was everybody else in the world. But uh, at that time, looking around my colleagues at BP, what I realized is that they were even more appalled than I was. And in the aftermath of the spill, I was tremendously impressed by BP's response. Uh, at the height of the operation to stop the oil spill and deal with the environmental consequences, BP fielded over 45,000 people on the ground in the Gulf of Mexico dealing with the incident. Uh, finally, the well was stopped, and uh, today, fortunately, the, uh, the uh, cleanup of the area has been quite successful, and uh, things are in much better shape than we had feared at the time. So some good things uh, came out of the Gulf of Mexico Institute. I was fortunate, I, I was not involved in particular in the, uh, in the response, but I was called to help with them uh, setting up a research program following the incident. That research program is called the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, and it was set up to monitor the environmental impacts in the Gulf of Mexico following the spill over a 10-year period with the intent that as time went on, uh, the studies would expand beyond the immediate impact of the spill, but also to include broader issues of 
how we can strengthen the environment in the face of human activity and human impacts because as unfortunate and we hope unrepeatable as that accident uh, was, we know that there will continue to be other sorts of accidents and that human activity will continue to impact the, uh, the natural environment. So the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative kicked off immediately after the response and uh, since then it has set up an independent research program and some of the activities that are listed here, there are now eight consortia funded in the Gulf states uh, looking at very as various aspects of environmental remediation. And so we're looking forward to 10 years of very, very productive research that we hope will make the environment a stronger place. So let me then move on and uh, move into the body of my talk. Let's see, is that what I was? Okay, I guess so. So what I'd like to do is talk about energy sustainability. So I'm going to start out by setting the scale of what we think is going on with the evolution of how we use em energy as a human race. So this, uh, this little cartoon illustrates some of the aspects of that, uh, of that situation. So right now, in the, fut in the present, uh, the world's energy almost exclusively comes from burning fossil fuels. A lot of people don't recognize that, but I'll show you some statistics in a moment. So to generate electrical power, we burn coal and gas. To power our transportation, we burn oil. And to produce the chemicals that uh, underpin many of our activities in daily lives, plastics, uh, polymers, for, and uh, polyesters for cloths, we use oil in the formation of petrochemicals. What we're facing are issues of energy security. These fossil fuels are not uniformly distributed around the world, and issues of concerns about climate change. And as we move into the future, we're also eventually going to start, at maybe towards the end of the century, mid, mid to end of the century, have to start working, worrying about fossil fuel scarcity. These fossil fuels are not infinite resources. Eventually, we'll use them all up. So we're looking at, over the time scale of this century, through mid-century to the end of the century, a transition that we have to weather and understand how to manage from generating our power exclusively with, with uh, fossil fuels to supporting our civilization with some more renewable and sustainable forms of energy. And as we move forward, we can imagine uh, dealing with climate change with things like carbon capture and storage and the development of alternative energy sources and eventually we'll have to completely depend on renewable energy sources. Moving from oil uh, to the use of more efficient engines, hybrid engines, electric vehicles, and ex increasing use of biofuels. And then finally, uh, relying entirely on electricity and biofuels, and possibly synthesized fuels. And in petrochemicals, moving from exclusive use of oil for many of the chemicals that we depend on to oil and biopolymers as the base of our chemicals, and eventually to bio, biopolymers and artificial uh, chemicals or artificial photosynthesis to generate the chemicals that we need. And I'll just mention that BP right now plays heavily in this space. BP is a major gas and oil producer. We produce about 3% of the world's gas and oil use. Uh, we have activities in carbon capture and storage. We have significant activities in alternative energy, particularly in wind, and we have a big activity in biofuels. So I'll be giving you some examples from those different areas of BP's energy investments. Okay, so let me just set the uh, scale here in terms of amounts of energy. And uh, it's very hard to grasp how big the energy industry is and how large an infrastructure we depend on to generate the energy that we need for our lives. These are some numbers that demonstrate world energy use. They're expressed in different types of units. The one that you might be most familiar with is watt hours, like the uh, watt hours that appear on your electric bill. This T here means a trillion. So this is 140,000 trillion watt hours of, of energy is used every, every year by the human race. So that's a very big number. Um, another number, a number that I'll be using in the talk a lot is TOE. That's tons of oil equivalent. So this number is 12 billion tons of oil equivalent. That's how much, again, energy we use every year. A, an oil equivalent is the amount of energy that you would get by burning a ton of oil. Okay, so burning a ton of oil generates uh, a ton oil equivalent of energy. So these are very, very big numbers, and it's very hard to make quick changes in how we generate all that energy that we're using. Uh, over here on the right, I just show some of the, oops, sorry, 
Am I going, the, yeah. So over here on the right, I just show some of the types of fuels that we're used to dealing with, the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. This is the amount of energy included in a kilogram of any of those fuels. You can see that natural gas is quite good, oil is not quite as good, coal is less good. The alcohols, butanol and ethanol, have less energy content than oil. And then finally, the carbohydrates, biomass like sucrose and glucose, are lower still. Okay, so what do we think is going to happen, or what's happening now, and what is likely to happen in the future in terms of the world's energy use? So this is a plot in terms of tons of oil equivalent of energy usage versus time. In the left, it's broken down between OECD as basically the developed world, uh, America, North America, Europe, and Japan, and Australia. Non-OECD is the developing world. And you can see that right now we're at the uh, about 12 billion tons of oil equivalent per year. And we project that going into the future, the developing world is pretty much saturated in its need for energy use. Continuing population increases in the, de in the de developing world will be matched by increases in efficiency. So we won't be needing to use much more energy in the developing world, in the, in the developed world, in the Western world. But in the developing world, things are very different. The populations are increasing more rapidly, and there's a significant need to improve quality of life. So you've got lots and lots of people in the developing world who have poor quality of life. In the future, their quality of life needs to increase, and there is going to be a vast increase in demand for, for energy. And this is a projection that BP does. It's not, a physical requ it's not what's physically requirement required by the laws of science. It's just our best estimate of what is likely to happen based on what we see government policies and human behavior being like over the next uh, 20 years. 20 years or so. So we think that the, uh, the amount of energy in the world is going to, being used in the world is going to increase from 12 billion tons of oil equivalent to about 15, so about a 25% increase in the, next, uh, in the next 20 years. Over on the right, we show the breakdown of how that corresponds to what types of energy, uh, were, were, what sources of energy are being used. So we see oil, gas, coal, nuclear energy, hydro energy, uh, use of, of water flowing over dams, and then renewables right now are such a tiny fraction of the total energy mix. So renewables mean wind, solar, uh, biofuels, geothermal, and a variety of other types of renewable energy. A very, very small, maybe two or three percent fraction of the total. Moving into the future, we think oil use is going to be relatively flat. It's not going to increase. Gas is going to increase a lot. Coal is going to increase a lot. Uh, nuclear will increase a bit. Re uh, hydro will increase a bit. Renewables will increase a lot compared to where they're starting. But starting from a very small basis, they'll still be less than 10% of the total energy mix by 2030. So that's our projection based on uh, present behaviors and trends. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of climate change and CO2 emissions, which is one of the drivers uh, that we see in place to change our future energy mix? So it's useful to pay attention to where CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases come from. The this is 2005 data. The plot on the left shows all the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in 2005. The total was 44 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So most of the greenhouse gas emissions came from the production of energy. That's this orange part of the curve here. Some of it came from land use and deforestation. Some of it came from agriculture, some from other sources. But about 60% or as maybe as much as 2 thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the production of energy. Now let's look at that 60% that comes from the production of energy and see how that breaks down in terms of different types of energy use. So of that 60%, over here shown in green, 40% is due to the generation of electricity. Burning coal and natural gas to produce electricity produces 40% of the energy CO2 emissions. Another 20% comes from burning oil for transport. And then we also have the use of coal and gas in industry. Uh, heating of buildings is a big one, and then there's a variety of other sources. So one thing that you can see as you look at this plot is that if you think about transport 
and changing transport into the use of electric vehicles. Uh, if you change transport into electric vehicles right now, you'll just transfer your CO2 emissions from oil to coal and gas. And so you really need to think about cleaning up your electricity production if you're interested in saving CO2 emissions by uh, electrifying transport. Okay, so in terms of climate change and in terms of CO2 emissions, what would make the world, what would be better? Uh, the goal that uh, climate scientists have put in place for preventing uh, more than two degrees of temperature increase during this century is to have the world's uh, climate stabilize at a concentration of two, uh, 450 parts per million of CO2. And this curve shows what it would take to get down to that level between now and 2035. So the upper part of the curve shows what is likely to happen in the scenario of the future energy use that I showed you. If we want to get down to 450, some things will have to change. The biggest and easiest thing to change is energy efficiency. If we improve the efficiency with which we use energy, and there's lots of ways to do that, we can make a huge transformation and a reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. Beyond that improvement in energy efficiency, things get more difficult. We need to have more rapid development of alternative energies, more development of biofuels, more use of nuclear, which is becoming increasingly problematic given the problems following Fukushima. And then finally, in this scenario, uh, the use of carbon capture and storage, some way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere is, is uh, perceived as important to reaching these goals. So that is what it would take to get to a carbon, kind of a carbon balanced scenario where the uh, atmosphere is, is preserved. And if we look at what that means in terms of the future energy mix, so here I'm showing a breakdown of, uh, again, the different types of energy shown in three different scenarios. Business as usual is what we're doing right now. New policies is the BP projection, which shows that by 2030 or 2035, we'll have roughly equal amounts of coal, oil, and gas, and then a mixture of the other sources. And then this 450 scenario that you see here, which would allow us to stabilize by the end of the century, still requires us to continue using a fair amount of coal, a fair amount of oil, and a fair amount of gas, much more nuclear, and a much more other renewables, as, as shown over here, to meet our future. So the, the lesson here is that even if we're very concerned about climate change and if we're very concerned about stabilizing and moving towards the future, to make that transformation, we still need to keep using fossil fuels. We're going to keep using fossil fuels through at least 2050, even if we have the most optimistic scenario about what we're going to do to transition to our future of alternative energies. So what I'd like to do now is talk to you a little bit about science in the context of that future of that future scenario. So we're looking at a future scenario where over the next 20 to 40 years we're still using oil and at the same time we're developing alternative sources of energy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some oil production issues and then I'll tell you a little bit about some biofuels issues. Okay, so one of the things that we do scientifically in the oil and gas industry is simply finding the sources of oil and gas. Oil and gas is hidden under the surface of the earth. When you drill a well to go down and find that oil and gas, it's very expensive. You need to know in advance that there's a good chance you're going to find some oil and gas when you get down there. The technique that we use to find the oil and gas is called seismography. And basically, the, what we do in seismography is above the surface of the earth, either above water or on the surface of the earth, we put some thumpers in place. And we create sound waves that propagate down under the surface of the earth. And they propagate down for miles. And thus, underneath the surface of the earth, the geological structure is stratified into layers of different types of rock with different types of density. And at each level, the sound waves can bounce off and be detected by a string of detectors, of uh, sound detectors. So you'll have all kinds of bouncing reflections coming off these different layers until you can find deep under the earth special areas where oil, gas, or water is trapped. 
and by the different type of signatures you get in this acoustic seismological detection, you can discriminate where the oil and gas is. It's a very hard and very challenging field. You can imagine that this is very complicated to look at what you're picking up on these sensors and figure out what was down there that caused the signal that you're observing. And in fact, BP owns one of the world's largest high-performance computers, which it uses to analyze these types of data. Okay, so we, uh, we use uh, seismology to find areas where we expect to find oil and gas. We also use seismology to characterize the subsurface areas that we might like to use to store car CO2 under the earth. So one of the solutions to climate change is the idea that you take CO2, you liquefy it, you pump it deep under the earth, pardon me, deep under the earth into a reservoir under the earth and then you cap your well and you hope that the CO2 will stay there. What we're looking for in a place that's good to store CO2 is an area under the earth that's porous enough to accept the CO2, but above that region, there's a layer of rock that's very impermeable to CO2, and we can do that with seismology, find areas like that and find places that we can, we can store CO2 under the earth and be confident that it will stay there for centuries and maybe millennia. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about getting oil out of those reservoirs once we found them or putting CO2 into those reservoirs once we found them. Um, this is a little picture that illustrates the way we really go about getting oil out of a reservoir. You've all seen movies where somebody drills an oil well and the oil comes gushing out and it's wonderful and everybody's drenched with oil and they're very happy. Uh, that's actually not how it works these days. We're very careful not to have the oil come gushing out, although I think people are still very happy. But that surge of oil uh, happens because the oil under the earth is under pressure. And once you've started pump taking some of the oil out, of the, out from underneath the earth, the pressure dies away, just like you're letting air out of a balloon. And the oil stops coming out so spontaneously. So what the oil industry does in that case is to drill a second well. And out of this well with the oil, as time goes on, you also get not only oil, you generally get a mixture of oil, gas, briny water, salty water, and often a lot of CO2. And so what we'll do is take, drill a second well here, take the brining water or the CO2, move it over to the second well, pump it down into the area where the, uh, where the oil is trapped, and push through the water, say, uh, to drive more oil out of that reservoir. And it's called water flooding or CO2 flooding. And the average industry recovery factor for getting oil out of a reservoir is only about 35%. So if you're interested in getting more oil out from the ground or preserving our, our oil supplies for the future, the easiest and best thing you could do would be to get more of that oil out of the reservoirs that we've already found, the relatively easy ones. So what can we do to do a better job of getting the oil that we've already found out of the rocks where it's trapped? Okay, the first thing we need to understand is that a reservoir is a pretty complicated arrangement. Uh, when I joined BP, I na naively thought that a reservoir was a big hollow under the ground with like a little lake of oil in it, but it turns out it's not like that at all. A reservoir is like a piece of rock that would look like any kind of piece of rock you might pick up by the side of a hiking trail. Uh, but in the rock, there's a certain number of pore density, and the little pores and holes in the rock might be a tenth of a millimeter in diameter or even smaller. And this is actually an experimental image of a piece of rock from a reservoir. We've imaged this using a special scientific technique called computed tomography. It's like a, like a CT scan that you might get from the doctor, and it shows us all the pore structure in the rock. So in fact, the oil that we're getting out of a reservoir is trapped in these little tiny pores inside a rock. And uh, we need to understand a lot about how the, the oil propagates through the rock and sticks on the rock to understand what we're doing when we get oil out of a reservoir. So here's an experiment uh, showing some of our investigations of what it takes to get oil out of the rock. So I mentioned earlier that typically we take the briny water from down below the earth and use it to flood the oil out of the rock. That's called a high salinity rock, uh, water flood. This is a cross section of a piece of rock where we've actually done that. We've taken the rock, 
driven high, high uh, salty water through the rock, and now we can image the pore structure in the rock, and we can see in blue areas where water is trapped, and in black where there's still oil left trapped in the rock. So you can see a lot of oil still left trapped in the rock. Uh, a few years ago, or maybe about 10 years ago, folks in BP started experimenting with changing how salty the water was. And amazingly, they discovered if we lower the salt concentration in the water and do the same experiment, we would start to get a lot more of the oil out of the rock. A big surprise, this is an experimental image showing much less oil left after we've pushed a low, low salt level of water through the rock. So this is called a low cell process that we're now using in some, of our, uh, in some of our exploration fields. But we still don't understand very well why it is that this works. And so there's a huge scientific opportunity here. If we can understand better what it is about the interaction of salt water and oil and the rock surfaces, then we can do a better job at getting even more out of the oil out of the rock in the future. So this just illustrates some of the, uh, the issues that we're looking at. We think that the issue with the oil and the salty water is that oil in general is nonpolar. And you wouldn't expect it to be very responsi responsive to salt density. But some oil molecules have polar groups on them. And we think that they're binding to the rock surface and that the level of salinity is changing how well they bind to the surface. Uh, that's similar to issues that we deal with when we're thinking about putting CO2 under the surface and having it stick in the rock. The CO2 can also stick in the pores and interact with the surfaces of the rock. So we have a big research program going on internal to BP and at uh, some partners in universities using all types of surface science techniques to measure the properties of the rock surfaces and the chemistry of how oil and different types of chemicals interact with those rock surfaces so that we can get, do a better job of enhancing oil recovery for the future. OK, so that's my oil example of science in the energy industry. And now I'm going to change uh, pace altogether. I'm going to talk a little bit about biofuels. So BP entered the biofuels industry uh, in a big way about seven or eight years ago. We're funding big research programs in biofuels. And biofuels are of interest as a renewable source of energy, as a low carbon source of energy, and as a source of energy that provides us with a lot of energy security because we can produce the energy locally within our country. And this uh, graph just illustrates why we see biofuels as a low carbon source of energy. When we burn gasoline, all the carbon that's present in the oil molecules gets released as CO2. With biofuels, such as ethanol, we've started with a process of growing a plant. And when we grow a plant, the plant uses the process of photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, it takes CO2 out of the air it takes energy from sunlight. It takes water and causes a reaction to form, to form carbohydrates, molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So farmers, of course, do this all the time, growing crops. And when you're growing crops with agriculture, uh, you use some fertilizer, you use some tractors. So you use some energy to grow your crops. And when you're using energy to grow some crops, you generate some CO2 because you're using energy. And then you uh, do some processing and you create your biofuels, most likely ethanol, by a fermentation process. Now you've got ethanol, C2H5OH. And when you burn it, uh, you get some energy back. So your net energy is your combustion energy minus the energy that you use to produce the biofuels. And when you combust it, you also release some CO2. And so uh, you release this CO2 and you have the CO2 you released up here. but Every molecule of CO2 that you release when you burn the ethanol originally came out of the air when you grew the plant in the first place. So this CO2 is free, and the amount of CO2 you release with a biofuel is only the CO2 that was released in the processing. So you wind up with a much, much lower amount of CO2 released per energy gained with biofuels than you do if you're burning gasoline or if you're burning uh, natural gas or coal. So it's a low carbon fuel. And obviously, what you'd like to do with biofuels is to find a way of producing biofuels that uses the less, least processed energy and releases the smallest amount of CO2 in its use to get the best bang for your bucks. Okay, And most of you here are quite familiar with biofuels. There's different types of biofuels. Uh, commonly in the United States, we use corn. 
uh, to create biofuels. Corn is an annual crop and it takes a fair amount of fertilization. And because of the fertilizer and some heavy duty processing, the delta E for corn is about 75%. So we wind up using a quite a lot of energy per the amount of energy that we get out of the ethanol that we generate from corn. Uh, another type of crop that's typically used to create biofuels in Brazil is sugar. Sugarcane is a perennial crop. It uses less fertilizer, less intensive agriculture. So typically the delta E, the amount of energy that you use up making uh, ethanol from sugarcane is about 50%. So it's a little bit better than corn. We're very interested in a third type of biofuels, which is called a second generation biofuel. And this type of biofuel doesn't use just the food part of the crop, but it, of the plant, but it uses all of the plant. It uses the stalk, the leaves, the stem, all the woody parts of the plant. That allows you to get a lot more biomass per acre than if you're just using the food part of the crop. So it's a really good idea to do lignocellulosic plants to create biofuels. And the type of plants that you might be looking at would be, well, first of all, you might use just the stover, the leaves and the stalks from corn, or you might grow a special uh, crop such as miscanthus or switchgrass or even trees such as poplar to generate the lignocellulosic biomass uh, to create biofuels. Now, if this was easy, we'd already be doing it, but it turns out it's not easy. And the reason it's not easy is basically the same reason that we don't eat wood. Wood's not in a very digestible form. So corn and sugar yield sugars uh, that are very easy for yeast to ferment into ethanol. Uh, lignocellulosic, woody plants, don't have plain sugars in them. They have a nasty polymer called lignin, and they also have nicer polymers that are polymers of sugars, many sugars linked together called cellulose and hemicellulose. The lignin basically we, we can burn to create energy from, but it's not breakable into sugars. But the cellulose and the hemicellulose polymers can be broken down to create sugars, which we can then ferment. So to develop a second generation or lignocellulosic biofuels, we need to learn how to break down these polymers in an economic way into sugars, which we can then ferment and turn into ethanol. So let's see what that takes. So typically what we do with this woody type of uh, plant is we do an acid pretreatment to kind of break up the plant and pull out the cellulose and the hemicellulose. And then we use some enzymes to break the hemicellulose down to a sugar. It breaks down into a sugar called xylose. And we take the cellulose and it breaks down into a sugar called cellobiose. And that sugar can then be broken down even further to a form of glucose. And glucose is what we kind of like because glucose is the sugar that the normal yeast we use for fermentation to make ethanol uses. So we can just take the same old yeast that we use today to ferment corn or sugar into alcohol and we can ferment this glucose and we can make ethanol. However, that leaves us with all of our xylose unused and so we're not doing a very effective gut job of using all of our available biomass. So we'd like to use this xylose as well. So people have thought about this and they've gone about and used the tools of genetic biology to change the yeast. And so the basic idea is pretty straightforward. Let's just change our yeast and add to it a new capability. We'll allow it to transport the xylose through its cell wall into its interior. We'll add a metabolic chain on the interior. So now the yeast can metabolize both the xylose and the glucose, and that sounds like a great idea. Now we have a yeast that's gonna use all of our products, all of our sugars from the, uh, from the LC biomass. And when you try that out, it works, but not very well. So what happens is that if you look here at the amount of glucose and the amount of xylose present as a function of time, what you find is that the yeast metabolizes the glucose first. It's sugar, it's yummy, it's delicious. It eats the glucose first, and only after all the glucose is gone does it go to the second best xylose and begin to metabolize that. So then your, your xylose starts to metabolize, but it's very slow, takes a long time, and you basically wind up not getting much yield. Okay, so what's the problem here? The problem here is that we're thinking a little bit in the box. We're thinking about, well, we know about yeasts that eat glucose. 
And so this uh, problem was brought uh, by a BP scientist to a young scientist, an assistant professor at University of Illinois, who was a brilliant young guy, and he looked at the problem and he thought out of the box. You know, we, we look at this and we say, oh, what's the problem here? We want to eat this glucose and we want to eat this xylose? This young assistant professor says, you're thinking about this the wrong way. Forget the glucose. Let's go for the cellobios instead. And that was a completely new way of thinking. We were all thinking glucose because we're used to yeast to eat, eat glucose. He said, no, let's do something completely different. So he did a different modification. He got rid of the glucose path and he added a cellobios path to the yeast. Okay, so here's what he did. So he got rid of the glucose path. Instead, he modified the yeast to have a cellobios path. Now it can eat the cellobios, metabolize the cellobios, and put out ethanol. At the same time, it's still got its xylose pathway as it did before. And when you try out this yeast, lo and behold, if you look at the amount of cellobios and the amount of xylose that's left outside the yeast as a function of time, the yeast eats up the cellobios, the red curve, and the xylose at pretty much the same rate uh, and produces ethanol uh, much more quickly and saturates at a much higher quantity of ethanol. So this is a huge breakthrough. It's the difference between a non-economic process and an economic process. And so this young guy, assistant professor, came up with a wonderful solution, published it in the open literature, and BP has now taken this and we're working in our laboratories to turn it into a commercially viable process that we hope in the future to put into our processing plants to create ethanol from lignocellulosic biomass. So I think that's a great example of basic science working with uh, industrial applications to come up with new processes that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to switch topics for a third time, and I'm going to tell you about a broader topic of energy sustainability that I've been working on for the last year or so uh, after I joined BP. And this has to do with the broader topic of energy sustainability. So I talked to you earlier in my presentation about climate change and CO2 uh, being released when we burn energy, and when we burn fossil fuels. Now, climate change is not the only problem facing the wor world. We right now are at a population of seven billion people. We expect by the middle of the century that there'll be nine or 10 billion people. And all these people on the earth are putting pressure on the earth's resources. Uh, we need land to grow food for people to have food to eat. We need water to, to irrigate the land. We need water for people to eat, to drink, and we need uh, water for industrial processes. And we just need to worry generally about the effects of all these people on the environment. And so I began a study several years ago to look at the impact of the uh, uh, constraints of natural resources, water and land specifically, and their relationship to energy. And what we wanted to know is, given constraints on the amount of energy and the amount of land available in the world, will we still be able to meet the world's energy needs in the future? And it wasn't clear to me what the answer would be when we began this study. Let me start by just showing you kind of generically where the energy in the world goes. Uh, this actually shows California, uh, but it's, it's typical for the rest of the world. So this is a plot that's called a Sankey diagram. And what it is, it's a plot showing the use of energy from its origins through to the final customers. So in the state of California, uh, most of their energy comes in in the form of imports. Some of their energy is produced in state in the form of oil and natural gas. Uh, of the imported energy, some of it is oil, some of it is natural gas, some of it is elect electricity generated by nuclear or burning coal in other parts of the world. As you move across to the right, we see what happens to that energy. We do some refining to change the oil into gasoline. We do some electricity generation to turn the natural gas and the coal into electricity. And then we transport those different forms of energy, say gasoline goes to diesel engines, petrol engines, electricity goes to electric motors, to natural gas burners, to electric heaters, and so on. And then when we move to the what the uses of the energy are, cars, trucks, uh, furnaces, I'm having a little trouble reading from an angle here, from heaters and appliances, and then to the actual uses, transport, 
Uh, here's a whole bunch of industrial applications, different types of human use, and then the final actual uses of these, uh, of these forms of energy. And an interesting perspective in terms of our sustainability question was what's the relationship between energy use, water, and land? As you can see right there and right there, water services, the amount of energy that's used to treat water for us to drink, for us to use in irrigation, and to treat our wastewater is a pretty small fraction of the total energy. And the amount of ener energy that's used for land services, plowing, transport, farming, is also a pretty small fraction of the, uh, of the energy. So that insight and a lot of work to quantify different uses of energy and different uses of water and land has allowed us to come up with this picture. So this is a picture where we've put energy in the middle and we've looked at its relationship to the atmosphere, to the use of different types of minerals, to the use of water, and to the use of land. So here energy has a very big connection in the burning of hydrocarbons to impact on the atmosphere. However, when it comes to water, we already saw that a relatively small, I'm sorry, a relatively small amount of energy is used in the treatment of water, and we've also found that a relatively small amount of the world's water is used in the production of energy. About 2% is used to get fossil fuels out of the ground, and about 9% is used in the, in the uh, generation of electricity. Most of the world's water is used as irrigation in agriculture. Land use, uh, deforestation has a big impact on climate. Most of the world's land is used either for uh, ecosystems or for farming. And then materials relate strongly to uh, land use and less strongly to energy. So as we look at this plot, we can see that energy is a relatively small player in terms of impact on water and land. And ultimately, as a result of this study, we've reached the conclusion that energy itself, in terms of the constraints on water and land, is not going to be significantly constrained. Water and land uh, limitations will still allow us to produce the energy that we need into the future. But that, of course, is not the whole story because these resources, this is an average picture over the entire world, these resources aren't uniformly distributed, especially not water. And so here's a picture that shows you the issues that the world is facing with respect to water. This is something called the Water Scarcity Index. It represents what fraction of the available water in a local area is being used by human beings for their uses. And if you use less than about 10% of your local water, uh, there's not much stress. But if you go up to 20 or 40% of your local water, you're really starting to stress the environment. And so the, the, the level of stress is a function both of rainfall and of local population. And you can see that there's vast areas of the world, China, northern India, the western part of the United States, where we already have significant water stress. Human populations are drawing down the available water very rapidly. And that's only going to get more extreme as there's more, more people in the earth. And so there's lots of places on earth where there's plenty of water, but there's also lots of places on the earth where there's not plenty of water and we were going to have to deal with those regional variations as we move into the future. Okay, so for us as a business, understanding this interaction between water and local regions is going to be very important, and so we've developed two tools to help us understand water and land use. And they're Sankey diagrams like the energy Sankey diagram I showed you before. This is a water Sankey diagram again for California. Mostly we're using California because they have really good records and it's a good test case for us. So this shows again water use from the source through to the end customer. In California, some of the water comes from the Colorado River. It's transported across state and uh, mostly goes to the production of agriculture. There's a lot of surface water use, some groundwater use, and as we move across the, uh, the uh, the page here, we go through distribution, moving the water around, treatment, cleaning it up so it's appropriate for our use. Uh, and uh, here we have energy used in, in cleaning up water for domestic and human use. Very little energy is used in treating water for agriculture. Most of the water still just flows through un uh, unperturbed and deals with the ecosystems. 
quite a lot is used in agriculture and smaller amounts are used in, uh, in human use. And so the energy impacts on water are here in uh, cleaning it up initially for use and there in cleaning it up before we uh, release it into the uh, sewage system. We can do the same thing for land use. And this is very important, especially for understanding what types of land is going to be available in the future for biofuels. And so then this again is California. On the left, we show the types of land that are present in California, ranging from forests down to what's called here shrubland, but that gets pretty close to high desert. And uh, as we move from left to right, this is land area. We can see temperate forest pretty much remains as forest. Savannah gets broken up largely into cropland, and uh, some of it is left as wilderness. As we move from left to right, uh, we see the cropland being broken up into different types of crop. Uh, the savanna goes to grazing land, forest stays as forest. And at this point in the plot, we make a transition. Up to here, we're showing land area. On the right-hand side, we're now going to show land productivity. And land productivity can be measured in terms of the land's potential to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and do things with it via photosynthesis. So here for the, uh, for the open shrubland, which is pretty much high desert, you can see we go from land area that's big to productivity, which is relatively small. That uh, desert land doesn't have a lot of capability to grow plants and uptake CO2 from the atmosphere. Our forest uh, goes from a relatively small land area to a fairly large and impressive CO2 productivity. And you can see that the, uh, the crops are also very productive in picking up CO2. So this shows all of our allocations and use of land as we move across now through the production of food, the production of feed. We lose quite a bit of CO2 productivity through waste and burning things. And then ultimately, the CO2 winds up locked in the forests, in the food, and, uh, and uh, some of it goes out of the state in terms of exports. So this gives us a good picture of how the land productivity evolves. And we can link this picture with the water picture and the water picture with the energy picture and get a good understanding for any given region where we've got the data about how all these things play together and what the impacts of different choices and different decisions about what we do with the land, the water, and the energy will make. So for BP, uh, here's the location of some of our businesses, shown with the blue dots, different types of businesses. And this is a graph that shows one projection of how water availability may change in the next 50 years. Some areas are going to have increasing water scarcity. Some areas are going to have more water. Uh, we and BP are going to have to deal with the variability, the changes in the water availability, and the impacts as responsible corporate citizens and to preserve our ability to operate in these areas. And the world as a whole is going to have to deal with these issues as we move forward into the future. So that's a quick summary showing different perspectives on energy sustainability and science in the energy industry. And kind of a summing up of everything I've been talking about today is this, is this graphic which shows uh, what we have to work with, energy, land, and water. Uh, we'd like to do that without trashing our world's ecosystems and without having our climate go uh, out of control on us. We have some real important agendas that we have to deal with, economic growth, climate change, local security. And we have all the drivers of change that we have to address as we come forward with our solutions in the future. We've got population change, societal changes, poor countries increasing their standards of living. We have limits on our natural resources. And I, as a scientist, uh, also see, and many of you as scientists, see technical innovation, our hard work in figuring out new ways to generate energy and to deal with our environment as crucial in our ability to move forward successfully into the future. So I really appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. I think uh, if you have questions, could you go to the microphone in the back so that everyone can hear your question, please?
I would like to ask why BP overlooked safety as an important part of their technology development. It seems to me the horizon did not have to happen. If proper safety measures would have been, you slowed down and didn't get too fast with this development, let the people on the rig make decisions, it did not have to happen. It was a criminal act by BP. Uh, the, uh, the, the issues in the BP uh, liability are under adjudication and I'm not allowed to talk about those things. Uh, I will say that right now BP's technology is placing a very strong emphasis on safety. A trillion dollars may be appropriate damages. So the question has to do with the quality of, of cleanliness in burning coal. There's a huge effort in making more efficient coal burning plant plants, which right away is a is a big big gain in efficiency, uh, in and in, in cleanliness. If you get more energy for smaller amounts of coal, you gain in every way. So there's lots of possible advances in in efficiency in coal plants. We do face uh, the fact that we have a big infrastructure of old coal plants that are quite inefficient. It's going to take time for those to be decommissioned and replaced with more efficient plants. And then the other uh, issue is uh, increasing environmental regulations to clean up the emissions from the, uh, from the coal plants, uh, which uh, are increasingly put in place in the United States and we're starting to see in China in other countries that as they face very severe air pollution issues, they're also starting to put in place uh, requirements to clean up uh, pollutants other than CO2 uh, that, that are problems from coal plants like mercury. Yeah. Next question. Okay, I think we've got folks in the back here, yeah. Is BP currently uh, researching or intend to research any uh, of the waste to energy potential, uh, specifically municipal solid wastes or sewage sludges to energy? Uh, we're aware of those, uh, of those initiatives. It's not, very, it's not well aligned with BP's business practices, so we're uh, following and, and it's called scanning and paying attention to those developments, but it's not an investment that BP itself is going to make. Yeah. Now that you're developing technology to break down the lignin and and the cellulose, I can see uh, parts of the world that are wanting a lot of energy, such as uh, India and China, yeah. South America. They also have huge uh, biomass reservoirs in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So I can see a continuing destruction of the rainforest. How is this going to be handled on a global scale? Yeah. The, the issue of, of biofuels and impact on the environment is hugely uh, important. So actually in Brazil, they've done a pretty good job of putting in place government regulations that protect and control the type of land that can be used for biofuels. And they have actually, despite what people think, there's not a direct uh, transfer of cutting down of rainforest to create bi biofuels in Brazil. In Brazil, they've basically required that biofuel production be limited to uh, existing sugarcane plantations that have become inactive because of declining economic demand for the product. And that's a really good model of government intervention. And what we're really going to need to have is very serious government intervention as biofuels development increases to prevent abuses and improper use of land. If things go well, you know, if there's good government policy, uh, and if the world sees an increasing use of advanced agricultural standards and sustainable agricultural standards, it would be possible to feed the entire world population in 2050 with the world's present level of cropland, say plus or minus 10%. That's a big if. That's assuming that in developing countries, Africa, uh, and other places where agricultural standards aren't great right now, that they come up to standards in the West. If that happens, and if we can food feed our world population on the existing cropland, then we think that there's at least 200 million hectares of land available to biofuels 
that are degraded land, abandoned cropland that could be used without impacting the forests. And that amount of land would allow the world to produce about 20% of its transport fuels. So I think that's a reasonable and sustainable goal and it will only be reached if there is good, serious government policy to make sure there aren't abuses. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm curious about the what is, can drive um, CO2 sequestration by, um, I forget what the technical term is, but pumping it underground. Um, uh -huh. What kind of economic incentives and policies are necessary in order to make that um, something that BP or any other um, entity would undertake? Yeah, so the, the economics of carbon capture and sequestration is a really tough topic. I sometimes make the joke that being asked to pay money to store CO2 underground is a lot like being asked to go on a diet so somebody else can lose weight. It's just not a very attractive economic uh, situation. So carbon capture and storage is only going to happen. We've been doing research on it. We think uh, we might need to use it in some places where we might be required to do to store carbon that's uh, CO2 that's co-produced with gas as licensed to operate to get access to the wells. Uh, for it to become a broader, more widely used process, for instance, taking CO2 from burning electric plants, that's only going to happen if governments require it to happen. It's the, there's, there's just at present no economic incentive that makes it something that people would spontaneously do. So my question is, um, <clears throat> you said the best, or uh, better than corn um, to produce biofuels is uh, sugarcane and woody yeah. material. Um, what would be the like energy and time and uh, monetary um, need to like switch over the United States economy from being corn based as far as agriculture and uh, um, other other types of like food and industries and stuff like that okay. to based on those types of uh, uh, products? Okay, so um, so if we wanted to change. Uh, biofuels, uh, ethanol to some other form of ethanol, the first thing that has to happen, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's likely that, it's not likely that there's going to be a switchover. It's more likely that there's going to be a parallel development. And I think the first thing that's likely to happen that is happening is the use of corn stover, the stalks and leaves, uh, to produce ethanol. And uh, Dow uh, DuPont has actually got a pilot plant and will be setting up a commercial plant in the near future. Uh, to get started with biofuels, uh, we need to have government requirements that biofuels have to be used because right now they're not, uh, they're not break even in terms of just allowing people to use gasoline. So without government incentives requiring a certain amount of biofuels in, the, uh, in our transport mix, people wouldn't be using or wouldn't be producing and using biofuels. So the transition from uh, first generation to second generation biofuels simply re requires uh, continuing government uh, regulation requiring certain fractions of different types of biofuels in the mix. That should be enough to make it go. And uh, as, as you've seen, BP is investing in developing lignocellulosic crops. We know DuPont is investing in uh, LC crops. There's tremendous research at lots of universities, including Iowa State. So as long as there's uh, a, a place for, that, uh, for those biofuels to go, that development will increase and eventually we'll get past the technology development hurdles and biofuels will become uh, economically competitive with, with gasoline. Uh, yeah, I have some observations yeah. and a question. Yeah. Uh, some scientists on NOVA 10 or 12 years ago made this comment that surprised me, yeah. that the Earth gets the equivalent of four and a half pounds of sunlight per second. And on the news, yeah. within the last couple of weeks on some program, they mentioned that the total energy use on the Earth today is equivalent to one hour of sunlight and the ultimate source of energy for this planet is sunlight. That's true. And, it, you know, we're using, we get 31,557,600 seconds in a year multiplied by four and a half. That's a lot of sunlight. Yes. We need to figure out some way to use that more effectively yeah. and quit burning stuff that pollutes our atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. Is there any research going on in trying to develop this? Of course, there's, there's huge amounts of risk. So let me just comment, which 
following your comment, which is, of course, all of the fossil fuels that we're burning, in fact, are stored sunlight energy. They that, that energy that's stored in those fossil fuels was put down by energy captured from the sun via photosynthesis. So we're still using sunlight energy. It's just very old sunlight energy. Uh, there's huge amounts of research. Of course, biofuels are another form of sunlight energy because that's direct capture of energy from the sun, transformation into biofuels. And then there's photovoltaics, lots of research on photovoltaics. Right now they are still expensive as an energy source compared with coal in terms of generating electricity. And one thing I mentioned in my early slide was uh, artificial photosynthesis or synthetic fuels. And so there's a lot of research probably on a 10 to 20 year timeline that's going on into figuring out ways to take sunlight and basically do what plants do, which is take sunlight, CO2, and water and make hydrocarbons or carbohydrates. And so that's, one, in my opinion, one of the very, uh, I don't know if I should say promising, but very exciting potential sources for our future use of solar energy to meet our energy needs. I, I met a student here that was doing research in chemistry several yeah. years ago, and he was trying to develop a catalyst, a yeah. one atomic level catalyst that he could yeah. run water over and get hydrogen and oxygen. I don't yeah. know if he had any success with that, but if yeah. he did do that, yeah. then you could get the hydrogen, save it, burn it, you get water back again, and you wouldn't be polluting with the carbon dioxide and stuff. That's right, yeah. I heard you talk about increased efficiency as a way of, as, as one of the factors in cutting down. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hear you say anything at all about lifestyle changes. Uh, how are you including that? And my other question is, what do you have to say about the people who think that we need to get down to 350 and not just down to 450? Okay, so uh, lifestyle changes. Efficiency is part of lifestyle changes. We would like to have efficiency without having it inconvenience us. In some cases it will, in some cases it won't. Other types of lifestyle changes have to do with t what type of food we eat, how much we drive, and those are all human choices driven by government policy and driven by what we think is, as civilized people. Uh, in terms of uh, people who think we should get down to 350 instead of 450, I have to say I'm I'm not very optimistic that we're even going to meet 450. Uh, the way the world is going right now and the rather slow pace of uh, social policy and decision making about meeting uh, uh, the needs of reducing CO2 emissions, uh, I think we're more likely to wind up at 500 or 550. So I'm, I'm sorry, that's a depressing answer. So I'm sorry, say that again. So, uh, <laughs> what incentives drive you as a scientist to further our efficiency than just governmental regulation and to push your agencies farther in using these technologies mm -hmm. than just the economic incentive pushed um, old school by the, by the government? So I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So when government policies are put into play, that yeah. puts, the, puts the pressure on the corporations to, um, to increase their productivity in abiding by the policies. But yeah. the policies aren't put into play until the, um, until the technology is there. And obviously, you're making grand steps yeah. in developing this technology. So what drives you as a scientist to do this and provide this for your company yep. um, before the company demands it of you. Ah, okay. So yeah, how how do I, as a scientist, encourage BP to look to the long term? And so that, in fact, is my job. <laughs> okay. So my job. I'm the chief scientist. I'm not the chief technology officer. So as a chief scientist, my job is to look to the long term and. Uh, make the case within BP that long-term investment is going to be important and that uh, it's in our best interest as a corporation to be prepared uh, to deal with a changing energy future. So 
making those arguments is my job, and I, I try hard to do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, it turns out that there are underway huge improvements in internal combustion engines. So we can look forward in the next 20, 40 years to internal combustion engines that use flywheels and other types of advanced technologies. So we can really, I think, expect to see 60, 80 mile per gallon internal combustion engines. So that's a huge potential for efficiency in transport. And then if you couple that with hybridization, where you also use your uh, fly-off energy to charge a battery, you can vastly increase transport efficiency, even if you don't go to fully electric vehicles. So I see that as a, as a big source of potential efficiencies. Yeah, well, there's... Uh, there have been, there's, there's ongoing every year, there's a climate meeting where all the countries of the world get together and discuss what their uh, commitments will be or won't be to changing the world's energy future. Um, it's been through some real ups and downs. At the last meeting, I think there was some indication that some of the uh, countries which had balked at uh, uh, limiting CO2 emissions because it would uh, impede their economic development are starting to think more seriously about uh, the opportunities that are available to them to moving forward into alternative energies and the impacts that climate change are likely to have. So we'll see. Uh, uh, it may be that, that there's a little bit of a hopeful trend and people slowly moving forward to finding a path to make some of these alternatives work. Um, one last question, yeah. and then and then I think we have uh, refreshments in the back of the room for a reception, and, and please stay to ask uh, further questions yeah. of the speaker. But there was one more question back here. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly in biofuels, in, uh, especially in uh, uh, sugarcane and lignocellulosic, there's a lot of biomass waste product that can be recycled back to the fields as fertilizer, and some of it can be recycled back as feed for cattle, some of it can be recycled back uh, to generate electricity to actually run the plants. So that's a nice example of, of use of the waste products in a constructive fashion. And there's many other uses, as someone mentioned, in uh, municipal waste. Lots of opportunities there for capturing waste. Another area that's largely untapped, but I think has got a lot of potential for reducing energy use, is the use of waste heat. So lots of our processes generate heat, often at a relatively low temperature, but there's in fact a lot of developing technologies that may help us capture that heat and use that as a way of recovering more energy. Please join me in thanking Dr. Williams. Thank you.